Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We have the cartoonist Seth under the hot lights today for a shoot interview. Jimmy, uh, please lay down some of that bibliography and let's jump right into things. Uh, in a lot of ways, it starts and ends with Palookaville. Started in 1991 in issue 24. We will talk about a little bit on this very episode. Uh, serialized several graphic novels through the run of Palookaville, including It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken. Um, George Sprott, Wimbledon Green, Great Northern Brotherhood of Canadian Cartoonists, recently Clyde Fans. He's also a very celebrated book designer uh, behind The Complete Peanuts, The Collected Doug Wright, John Stanley Library, The New World, uh, comics from Mauritania by Chris Reynolds. He has shown work as a sculptor, builder, fine artist with Dominion and The Living Room Suite. This is a renaissance man, Seth, and a huge inspiration to me over the years as a cartoonist that's really a unique voice in comics. So thank you for joining us, Seth. This is an honor. No, it's a real pleasure. I'm glad to be here. We, uh, we, you know, we associate you early on. It's the, it's the triumvirate, the trinity of, uh, you know, Toronto cartoonists. It's Seth, it's Chester Brown, it's Joe Matt. Uh, and, and we recently lost Joe Matt. Uh, and I, would like you to just acknowledge that we haven't talked too much Joe Matt we have peep show to look forward to on future episodes but uh tell us about your experience with the man uh Joe was yeah Joe is like a brother Chester and Joe you know this is the thing they were just like brothers and um like brothers you have complicated relationships with them you know with your friends you treat them well but with your brothers you can be kind of harsh on them and uh, the three of us, I think we had a pretty um, complicated relationship. Um, it's lasted 30 years at least, and hopefully with Chester, many more. But Joe's gone now, and um, that was a big shock. Uh, I'm still dealing with that, still processing it. Um, I mean, I was, I've was i been going through for over my, almost you know 15 years or whatever, a bit of loss just at losing Joe Matt as, a, as his comics. I wanted more Joe Matt. Um, it's a shame that Joe couldn't do it, uh, because, you know, uh, Joe was a great cartoonist. He really could, you know, he could just, he had that skill that all, we all want, which is the ability to just tell a story in the comics language, um, as it was meant to be told, like the greats, you know, you look at somebody like, uh, Roy Crane and you're like, this guy can tell a story. That's the key skill for a cartoonist. And Joe had that. And I would have liked to have read comics by Joe when he was like an 80 year old man. Those would have been great comics. I would have loved seeing those comics where he can't go to the bathroom and <laughs> losing his sex drive, you know, trying to get by on a dollar a week. Those would have been great comics. Um, but Joe wasn't going to be doing them anyway. That's a sad thing. He'd fallen into some kind of an artistic block. But, you know, I still would have just liked to have had him around. Uh, he, you know, people think of Joe Matt as a creep as a, as a, some kind of a jerk, but yeah, you got to remember that's the image he wanted people to have in real life. Joe was very sweet. He was crazy, but he was very sweet. And, uh, you guys would have liked him a lot. You really would have, I guarantee you would have been charmed in an hour. You would have like talked about him for a week. And then at the end of that week, you would have said, I've had enough Joe Matt. <laughs> They, thanks so much for, for, for that little bit. We wanted to acknowledge Joe on the channel. Uh, but you mentioned, you know, you would have liked to have seen more of his comics. And uh, the new Palookaville, we did an episode on it a couple of weeks back. And one of the things that we made mention of was the slightly looser hand uh, that, that you employ for, for making this comic. And, and I said something like, uh, I felt proud of you in a way for, for allowing, because the cartoonists of your generation very much are uh, craftsmen that don't don't you know sort of burnish off the the rough edges for for a long time there but i feel like you've had some breakthroughs with uh you know wimbledon green and some of the stuff you did before that to to like allow this kind of material yeah. to be seen see the light of day and it makes me feel like maybe we'll be able to see more seth comics with more frequency uh is is sure. am, am i in the right ballpark with that yeah, you are. I mean, this is the thing about, you know, being a cartoonist, as you guys know, you spend years and years to develop your style. You struggle to get it just right. You want to make perfect images. And then you get to a point where you're like, I can't stand to do this anymore. I want to change my style. I want to loosen it up. I want to, you know, you do some rough drawings and you're like, these are nicer than the finished drawings. It's like the finished drawings half the time kill the drawing. 
Um, for myself, it was the brush. The brush was, you know, like uh, a tool I spent years learning to use and then got, you know, so finicky about it. It's like, you know, when I'd work on a Clyde fans page, it would take me like a couple of hours to draw it, a few hours to ink it. And then I would sit there for like eight hours whiting it out. Every careful little bit. It was like, got to the point where I couldn't stand it. And so I started to try and loosen up in my sketchbooks. That's where Wimbledon Green comes from. But since then, I mean, I've just sort of embraced this idea that, you know, I'm only going to get so much work done in my life and it's got to be easier. So I'm working on a variety of projects right now where I have thrown away those old goals. I mean, it's a fetish desire to make perfect art. You want that perfect art. Um, I think my generation was particularly um, fixated on that. Um, we'd come out after the undergrounds with masters like uh, Crum and Deitch, and they were studying like the masters before them. And I think all of us wanted to produce, you know, that kind of slick comic book art. Um, so it took a long time to get that out of my brain. But I, I'm working on a big graphic novel right now. I'm probably a couple hundred pages in. And the key secret is I'm just not using a brush anymore. I'm working with magic markers. That is amazing to me. And, you know, going over some of your work, and I, I mentioned it in the introduction, you work in such a variety of media and art forms. Does that, did, did that inform some of your moving away from such a precise style? Like there's a quote in the new Palookaville about um, whenever you made the buildings, when you were making the buildings that we see in Dominion, that precision was, was not your strong point, which is shocking to read because as a reader, I do think of your comics as extremely precise, but is that something that you learned, like making those buildings that you then bring back to your comics work? Yeah, it's part of a process. I mean, it must be about 20 years ago, I started working on the city of Dominion. And the reason I started working on it was, I mean, at that point, I just thought of myself as a cartoonist, pure and simple. It was cartoons I was gonna do, that's what I was interested in. And I was coming up with a new graphic novel idea. And I thought to myself, it would take place in a certain city and that city, I needed to define that city. So I thought, I'll, you know, I was working on Clyde fans. I knew I had a long time to go before I got to the next book. So I said, I have time to figure out the history of the city. And I started working on the history of that city in a, in a notebook. And at the same time, I thought, oh, I'll make a little model, a little model of a building, because then now will give me some time to think about this business that I'm inventing. Because I thought I'd make the city up kind of piece by piece. And then it would connect somehow. Somehow all these things I was making up would make a story eventually. So I just made a little building. But I wasn't worried about what the little building looked like. I just wanted it to be fun for me. So I was just cutting some cardboard, going back to the kind of thing you do as a kid. Cut out some cardboard, put some paint on it, you know, some poster paint, glue it together, put it in a corner. It was fun. I did not intend to show these to people. Over the next few years, I must have made about 40 of them. And I made... As I did it, I wrote little histories of these places in my notebook. And eventually I made a hundred of these. So the city, like as an object, appeared and a couple of curators saw the city and they wanted to put it on display. And that's, I think, was a changing point in my life. Those first couple of exhibits of showing the city with my comics kind of made me realize I could do other kinds of work if I wanted to. And I think that's when I started to think of myself more just as a working artist and less as a cartoonist graphic novelist. Now I work, I have a ton of stuff I've done that nobody sees. And, um, and a lot of it is working in collaboration with people. I have like ceramic artists I work with, metal artists, people like this. And I think letting go of that control to collaborate with somebody is also part of what led me down this path to not being so anal about everything. You could just, you know, why not do a story in the sketchbook? And that's good enough. I'm so glad to get this uh, on the record from you, Seth, because uh, when we last saw you, we were at a, uh, it was SPX, and we were on a panel with you and I think Bob Sikoriak. I forget what the exact subject matter of that panel was, but um, you said something, you, you were sort of a little bit, it's, it seemed maybe dismissive a little bit of, of the, the, the sketchbook stuff in, in a way. And uh, it was that self-effacing thing that would come from a lot of the guys in your generation were kind of like yeah. dash it off or whatever. And there, there's a problem that comes with that. And it's that 
the, the, your audience hangs on your every word and, and sort of believes it all. So there were people from academia in that audience that I, that we know, and they're now telling their kids at school like, yeah, Seth didn't even care about Wimbledon Green. He just like sloughed it up. They just threw it out there. It's no big deal. Just put lines on paper. Just do it. You have six months. And everybody was like, no, dude, like that is not the message, man. That is not exactly what you like. You, you need to have some history with Seth. So I'm glad to have that part on the record because that's a more accurate way to explain the idea of loosening up and, and the benefits of, of, of that and all that. Uh, could, could we jump back a bit and, uh, it's a, it's a rare opportunity. Hoche Anderson gave us a little bit, but he was a youngster uh, and didn't have too much experience with Vortex Comics. But uh, let's talk about Bill Marks, Vortex Comics, how you get into the game. Is Mr. X your first published work? Yes, it is. I'm pretty sure. I'd have to think it carefully through, but I'm, I'm almost 100% sure. It's funny you mentioned Ho. Hoche Anderson was there the first night that Chester and I became friends. We uh, um, we went, to, like, really became close. I mean, we talked and met before that, but we went down to the Motor City Con. Bill Marks of Vortex Comics drove me and Chester Brown and Hochi Anderson, who was probably about 16 years old, down to Motor City Comics Convention. And we were up all night, and um, Chet and I just talked and talked in the hotel room, and Ho, and Ho just sat in the corner kind of angrily making snide comments on things. Um, and I must say that... Um, that was like, that's really memorable to me because, of course, the start of a great friendship, but also from meeting Ho, because uh, just gonna, before I get into things, I think he was the most talented young person I ever met. God, that guy could draw with a sophistication. That, I mean, Adrian Tamine was extremely talented at 17, but I think Ho just like had so, like, you know, I've never seen anybody draw like that. Anyhow, getting to the real point, the real part of the story. Um, I went to art school. Uh, I wanted to be a comic book artist, and I was coming straight out of a little town. I had grown up reading Marvel comics. When I got to art school, I was still thinking about superheroes. Um, but within one year of that, that was over. I didn't, you know, but I didn't know. It's like I, what happened in that one year was that I no longer wanted to draw Spider-Man, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I didn't, I still wanted to be a cartoonist because, I mean, you get tricked into being a cartoonist. You spend all those years studying and practicing reading comics. I didn't want to be a painter. I didn't want to be a photographer or anything like that. But then I was at a loss. I didn't know what to do. And, and I think I dropped out sometime in like my third year of art school. Still kind of confused, but it was right around that time I discovered Love and Rockets. Actually, Ken Stacy. I went into I went into Vortex Comics to talk, and Ken Stacy was the editor of Vortex Magazine. And uh, I showed him some shitty comics. And he took me downstairs to the Silver Snail comic shop. And he's like, buy this comic book, which was Love and Rockets number three. And that turned everything around for me. Within a year, I discovered Crumb. And, you know, I was reading all kinds of stuff. But Love and Rockets, that was really like, that spoke directly to me because I was 23 years old. And Jaime was probably, I mean, Gilbert, what were they? 25, 26? Um, they were writing directly to my generation. So then I started to figure out kind of what I wanted to do, which was I wanted to make comic books for adults. But it would take me years to figure it really out. But what happened, though, was um, I went back to Vortex Comics, and I just showed up there at exactly a moment when the Hernandez brothers had left, and they needed somebody to draw Mr. X and Bill Marks. I mean, I guess Bill was lazy. He just picked a kid who came in off the street and said, would you like to draw uh, Mr. X. And so even though I can't stand to look at those comics, even for a second, um, it was a super important experience to draw them because one, I didn't write them. So I don't have to take responsibility for those comics. Two, um, it's really a mind blowing experience to see your work in print and see, to have that experience of, you know, you draw them on these big boards and then they're printed and suddenly it's glaringly obvious everything that's wrong. And that process, issue by issue, of seeing each new set of what's wrong kind of teaches you to be a, a, a professional cartoonist, to see the work in print. And that was super important. So by the time I got to doing Palookaville number one, that I had had that experience in apprenticeship. And that was, thank God, because it gave me, like, you know, the background I needed. 
were you finding uh, influences? You know, I, often I hear like New Yorker as an inf New Yorker style cartoons as an influence on you, and I feel like that's apparent from Palookaville Number One. Are you absorbing yeah. those influences and looking outside of the direct market uh, while you're doing Mr. X and like you know, kind of figuring out the style that you want to work in? Yeah, that was a huge period of figuring stuff out. I mean, when I got in, when I started on, on Mr. X, I probably was like mostly looking at Jaime. Um, within, you know, a year, I was probably studying Hergé and Chaland. Um, I mean, Dean Motter and Paul Ravache were older guys who were turning me on to stuff too. So I was really immersing myself into Art Deco and into uh, the, the woodcut novels of like uh, Lindward and stuff like that. And that opened a whole door to, I started collecting old old, uh, old books and that's when I found the cartoonist of the old New Yorker. And that was a revelation. I think it was Peter Arno more than anyone that really changed what I was trying to do. And, that, and you, if you look through those Mr. X's, as crude as they are, you can see from issue to issue, like wildly careening from one thing to another as I'm trying to absorb these influences, trying to capture that kind of um, vermicillitude of backgrounds that Hergé is doing, at the same time trying to get that like big, bold brush line that like Peter Arner is using. There's a whole issue, I think, where you can't see anybody's feet because suddenly I couldn't figure out how to draw anybody's feet in a new approach. Um, but that was all super valuable. Um, and by the time I get to Palookaville, I'd also been working as a commercial illustrator for a couple of years. So I was also absorbing a lot of old style uh, illustration, a lot of old children's books like H.A. Ray, a lot of that 40s material. I was very, very interested in trying to capture like an old style of drawing at that point. Now, I don't think about that anymore. I'm not trying to draw old fashioned anymore. Um, I don't really even think that much about what I'm drawing like anymore because you get locked in. But that stuff, you know, it determined what my work would look like for the rest of my life. It's a fascinating style because, you know, trying to prepare to talk to you today, I can't think of other cartoonists that were really putting those types of influences on display in their work at that time. Um, you know, it seems like, in hindsight, a very bold direction for you. Um, I started reading alternative comics probably in the late 90s. And, you know, you were a staple. The, the Drawn and Quarterly and Fanographics groups were kind of like these staples of what I could find. And it's, it's a number of artists who all showed up with their own voice. And I, that doesn't happen very often. There aren't a lot of those moments in comics history where it's like suddenly you can name half a dozen or maybe eight cartoonists, fantastic, but all really working in different areas. Did you have reservations about like, wow, this is a different style? Um, you know, was it hard to go that way? Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the books that we make, and we have a lot of stuff coming out in the very near future. Uh, sooner than later, in mid-October, comes the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus for the 10-year anniversary of my Hip Hop Family Tree series. After that comes X-Men Grand Design Trilogy, which collects all three volumes of my X-Men Grand Design comics. There are two trades of Red Room out there right now. Anti-Social Network and Trigger Warnings, but the third, uh, called Crypto Killers, is coming out in January. Jimmy's been self-publishing uh, some comics and magazines lately. Uh, the Black and White Zine, 1986 Zine, and True Crime Funnies are coming to you uh, sooner than later. October, what date? 26. 26 is going to be a sale at his website. Make sure you jump on that. Finite copies available. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty is coming to you in November. It is a companion piece to the Street Angel Deadly Scroll Alive trade paperback. And before you is a bibliography of all the stuff that we have on the stands to date. Now let's get back to the video. Yeah, no, I didn't. And I should bring up a real missing link of, of comics for me in that period that might make it a little clearer. And that's Maurice Velikoop. Maurice Velikoop was a friend of mine in art school. And he was like much more talented than I was and much further along. He was already producing recognizable, mature work when he was in like first or second year of art school. And Maurice always had a really wide Catholic set of interests. So he, he I mean, I don't think, I don't think I, he ever, we ever talked about the New Yorker cartoon, say, but, but he had a great love of certain uh, like children's book illustrators that he turned me on to, like Margaret Bloy Graham and people who had big, broad cartoony styles. And he had just such a sensitive 
old fashioned cartoony approach that was really full of like a lot of um, a lot of humor and a lot, you know, he wasn't afraid to draw things just in a funny way, but yet they were serious at the same time. That was a real eye opener for me. Even somebody like Chester, who was a enormously influential on me, he was drawing in a more straightforward manner. I mean, Chet was doing um, kind of co a comic book illustration that on some level was derived from the mainstream comics that came before and some of the undergrounds. Um, and I could understand that easily. Maurice was certainly coming out of a new world for me and that was big, that opened a door for me to look around. But you're right, that was a really great period because suddenly there were about 25 cartoonists in North America that were doing really individual work. And I think almost immediately recognized that there was some little movement going on. And there were a lot more than 25, but I'm thinking of the people who survived, who stuck around. There were easily 50 or 75 people who were on the fringes altogether. But I mean, when you look at that group, uh, people like Peter Bagg, uh, Dan Klaus, you know, it's like uh, Chester, you can't, they're so different. They're so different. And yet there is a commonality of seriousness underneath the work. Julie Doucet, uh Joe Matt. It's very interesting when you look at, you put all these people next to each other. It's really a wide variety of stuff. And actually, you know, right after that period was a slightly fallow period. I remember around the late mid nineties, there was a few, a handful of cartoonists. I can remember Adrian Tamene was around and maybe Tom Hart, a couple of people. And I remember thinking, saying this to Chester, like, where's the next generation? Uh, they're not coming along. It was just a handful and they were not quite as formed. But then 2005 or something, there must've been a hundred cartoonists. Everything changed. Now there's so many, I haven't a clue. I don't know who's who. <laughs> <laughs> so the last issue of your contribution to uh mr x issue 13 that's 1988 palookaville one starts uh publication date 1991 april uh is that middle stage from get, getting to uh mr x to palookaville in, in ch forming your style uh more maturely would you cite that it's the illustration game where you're kind of figuring yeah. that out? Or is there like a lot of sketchbook stuff that, w that we haven't seen yet? Not really. No. I mean, I did a little bit of, you know, preliminary comic stuff, but that Palookaville number one is really like, that's the first real comic after Mr. X. I just sat down and, you know, I worked on that and probably not very long. And, and you know, I imagine I turned that out pretty quickly in retrospect but I was doing a ton of illustration at that point. And that's another thing. Maurice Velikoop was an illustrator. And I looked at him and I said, like, this is the answer. You do some commercial illustration, you make some money, and then you can do some comics on the side. Um, so I was I was really working hard in, in illustration at that point. And, um, and that really, I think, is a big part of what shapes my whole style and approach as I get to Palookaville number one. I mean, I look back on that first issue and I think like so much of that is just seat of the pants. I mean, not really thinking things through in the way I would think about how to tell a story now. That's just the straightforward years and years of reading comics. And then you sit down and you have a panel, a big panel, and you have some smaller panels under that. And then you go to the next page and you just start, you tell the story rather than now, of course, I think a lot more about what I'd be doing on those pages. Can you talk a little bit about Drawn and Quarterly and, and maybe Chris Oliveros? Uh, I don't know if he had influence on, on your direction at all or on the way your comics evolved, but you know, you make a transition from Vortex Comics to Drawn and Quarterly between the Mr. X work and Palookaville. So can you talk about Drawn and Quarterly and what's going on there in the early 90s whenever you show up? I'm going to add to that. Uh, was Vortex Comics an option for Palookaville number one to be published? And, and if so, why, why would you have chosen Drawn and Quarterly over Vortex? Yeah, it was not an option by the time I left Mr. X, I can tell you that. <laughs> Bill and I, we left on very bad terms. I mean, literally, we had a showdown at the end where I brought in like his business partner secretly and said, like, I've invited Ron here because I want to make sure that what happens here is like everybody knows. Um, and and uh, Bill was furious. Um and we had a, a big fight. I walked out of that office and I got out in the street and I was like, you know, shaking because I was so stressed out. Um, and so there was no chance anything was going to be happening at Vortex. Uh, co coded to that story, Bill and I have made that up in the years since. Um, 
And I have to say that any troubles I had with Bill Marks, um, he was good to me in the long run. Ultimately, Bill Marks, you know, he really did, uh, as much as we ended up having troubles and ended up not being friends at the end, um, he did, uh, in a fatherly way, support me in those years, even though we were exactly the same age. Um, but anyway, so I went to I went to uh, Drawn and Quarterly, and um, I wasn't planning to go to Drawn and Quarterly. I was planning to approach Fantagraphics or Kitchen Sink. But I met Chris Oliveros, and he had put out one comic book at that point, which was Drawn and Quarterly number one. And he was just about to put out uh, Dirty Plot number one. And I told him I was I was going to uh, put out a first issue of my comic, and he knew my work as an illustrator. He didn't know me from Draw by Mr. X. And he just said, like, I'll publish that. And I was, you know, I was just was like on the spur of the moment. I was like, I've got a guy who's going to publish it. Why, why go to Fantagraphics? Like, let's just do it. So I said, OK, let's do it. Uh, sight unseen, he accepted it. And um, and Chris Oliveros was the greatest guy in the world to work with. Uh, Chris Oliveros gave me every opportunity to allow me to become the artist I am because he he was uh, endlessly supportive. Like Chris did not get involved in what you were doing. He was not an editor. Uh, you would finish the issue and you would send it to him. And we would always complain about this. We'd send it to him. And then you'd, you'd hear nothing. And you'd call him up. Hey, Chris, you get the issue? Yeah, I got it. That's it. He wouldn't <laughs> say great. You'd be waiting for him to say, like, it was a masterpiece. No. But... The, tr the thing about him, though, was that he was like, you know, his policy was if he liked your work, he just trusted you. He was there to give you the freedom to grow. And over the years, what he also gave me was the production values to learn to be a cartoonist designer. So that I, I mean, I think one of the things in our generation of cartoonists is we might have been the first cartoonist granted the right to design our books and our comics. The old cartoonists certainly could have done a great job. But they weren't given those. I mean, you look at poor Kirby. Kirby never got to probably design a book or even his own comic. He got to do the cover. He never got to even probably do the, the lettering. Um, so, you know, this was a big shift in the comics world to have not only them give you the, uh, you know, the whole package, but um, to slowly like dole out the production values. So you could say, could I have a metallic ink on this? Could I do a fold out? Could I do, you know, and bit by bit. And Chris was always of the, sure, let's do it. Um, and as each of those things gets under your belt, you learn how to design. And um, you need that. You can't just, maybe you can do that now without, because the com the computer is like such a production studio that a young artist could maybe learn it on their own. But in those days, you seriously needed to have that presented to you. Did you have any formal design background? Did you take design classes when you were in art school? Did you ever work as a designer? Yeah, I took design classes, but I was too young. I didn't understand what it meant. When I took topography class in first year art school, I just could not understand what they were talking about. They'd show you a good design and a bad design. And I would think, I can't tell the difference. It's like, they're just some words on a page. It's like, why is that the good design? Um, I never understood that. I didn't understand. There was so much I did. I mean, I was a total rube rolling in from like, I still had hay in my hair. Um, there was, I had no understanding of the history of art. The only art I knew when I got to art school, like really, was comic books, television, and going to the library. That's it. So those years of, you know, being exposed to art, and more importantly, to the other students who knew art, um, that kind of taught me things. But I have realized over time, you learn what good art is, what good design is by developing taste. You have to have taste and that has to be developed by yourself. You have to look at things, you have to figure out what you like and why it's good. That's a long process. I think that the idea of taste is very confused in the culture because the idea of good taste is seen as snobbish and related somehow to like some upper crust society or something. But taste is the simple matter of winning, winnowing down your decisions, your choices. I mean, it's what you do as a cartoonist every day. It's like, I draw a potato nose. That's because I like a potato nose on a character. That's a design choice. That's taste. Enough, make enough of these decisions. You have a style. 
you make enough of those decisions and you've designed, you know, you have a design approach. Um, my books look like my books because they reflect my taste. If you were to look at like your books, they reflect your taste and nobody will confuse our books because we have very different approaches. In the, uh, in the nineties, when Palookaville starts coming out, um, it's kind of a two part question, I guess. Uh, did you have to subsidize the production of the comic with illustration uh, for, for the bulk of the 90s? And if that's the case, can you describe the, the kind of juggling of, of, of the two professions? You, you know, how much, how much uh, comics time would you get afforded uh, with X number of illustrations or whatever the formula might be? Yeah, I mean, it always has to be. Uh, there's always ex extra money from other sources. Comics, maybe I could make more money in comics if I worked harder and produced more comics. Maybe. I don't know. I think the, thing, the truth is there's a market for your work, but it's not an enormous market. And even if you put out more comics, you might actually turn off the people that like your work because there'd be too much of it. Um, the truth is there's, you always, I think, there's, you know, most cartoonists have to have a few, a few fingers in different pies. And certainly for me, commercial illustration was where it was at in the 90s. I did a lot of commercial illustration and I did it at the expense of comics. I mean, I, I worked more on illustration than comics. I would put a couple of months aside here and work on a comic, then go back to illustration or try and do both. It's very hard to do both at the same time, but you know, it depends on the jobs. Um, and I think the big thing too was I didn't produce as much comics over those, you know, those long 20 years or whatever, because I was living life. Um, when you're doing several, you know, several things at the same time, stuff gets put on the back burner, you get around to it, you come back to it. Um, I never really had a, a feeling like I'm not a, like a real cartoonist in the sense of the cartoonists who work before my generation. And that's that I don't work on deadline. Um, I never turned out a comic book that ever came out more than twice a year, probably. And that was in the first couple of years of Palookaville. Um, since then it's like once a year, once every two years, once every three years, whatever. But I don't think about comics in that sense any longer. I just think about a body of work. I'm producing a body of work. And when I'm dead, this body of work will exist. And it won't matter when it came out. There'll be a finite number of books and objects and sketchbooks and whatever. And that'll be the body of work. The whole idea of like getting the work out in a timely manner for the audience, that disappeared like for me 20 years ago. I mean, if I cared about that, Clyde Fans is a total failure then, because by the end of Clyde Fans, there's probably not a single person reading Palookaville who would have had any idea what that story was about. Who could who could say? I mean, like, I could, couldn't even have remembered probably what was in the first parts of the story. So I, I just don't think in those kind of terms. But so, so I've always been doing a lot of different things and always been making money in a variety of ways. Um, that's not the only way to do it, though, of course. Chester Brown only does comics, and he manages it. I mean, I know he's taken grants. I have, too. Um, I know he does, you know, the occasional thing outside his work. Um, and um, we just have a different approach. Chad is just like, I only want to do comics, and he's always been that way. And he's like, I will gear my lifestyle to whatever money I can make from comics. And I'm like, I want more money. I have a lot of things I want to buy. Um, I'm, I, 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 I am a spendthrift, so I need to do other things to make more money than comics will give me. Um, but I'm glad in the long run because it led me down these other fields. I wouldn't have, like, Chester would not have designed the complete peanuts if they'd asked him. He just said, no, I'm busy. I'm, I'm working on my, uh, working on the notes for some comic book for the next two years. Um, but I'm like, Sure, I love Schultz. I'd love to do it. And that opens the door to something that leads to something else and et cetera, et cetera. And you end up doing all kinds of things you didn't set out to do and that you didn't realize you actually like. Complete peanuts. Got to show it off, man. There it is, dude. Bro, behind my back, you see every single volume waited for those things. Honor. And I loved working on when, when When I was at uh, Fantagraphics once, uh, they just received a package from you for whatever volume was was coming out, you know, forthcoming. And and here's how I remember seeing it because they showed it to me. I you know I nagged them probably and said, can I please see what 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 Seth's design stuff looks like? And in my mind's eye, it's been a while, at least a decade. Uh, it was pretty practically done uh, by hand stuff 
uh, kind of like a sketch by uh, from your hand. It wasn't like a Xerox of a Schultz panel or anything like that. It was like, you know, a sketch that, that, yeah. that you did, uh, maybe color pencil. And it would be kind of a dummy. Like I remember it being super, super thick. So, but, but all hand done, all practical, all, you know, there's no InDesign file or, you yeah. know, no, no that's, still, that's still true. I mean, although the big difference between much of that work and now is that I have um, an artist, a production artist I work with on a more close level who is very, very used to my method. So this would be Tracy Huron. And um, and now I have I know I know enough to scan things. So so I still work exactly the same way. But now I will just scan pieces of things and send them through to her and she will assemble everything up into full files. In those old days, I was th that intermediary stage didn't exist. I would send the big pile with all the notes to type, typewritten out with all the hand drawn things. Sometimes there'd even be a dummy book like I have dummy books for like Wimbledon Green, say, that has like, you know, where I've recreated the book physically and sent it to them so they know exactly what it's going to look like, where everything will sit. And then every page that needs design work will have the several, several drawings with the overlays and the notes. And that's all still exists, except now the notes are just typed out on email. Just, you know, it's all, it's, it's perfunctory, but I'm still not the guy who's making anything digitally. The, uh, the design stuff, for any, anyone watching this at home, uh, you can find a bunch of those Peanuts designs in Comics Art number eight, I believe. There's there's a two-page spread. It's the in-the-studio stuff, so you could probably find that in the in the studio book as well. And it's it's very inspiring for anyone who's a fan of design, uh, definitely to check out. Um, I have kind of a weird question, uh, if you'll humor me here, Seth. Sure. Shortly after the Peanuts, complete Peanuts came out, there was the the release of uh, Dick Tracy, the the complete yeah. Dick Tracy stuff, and um, I was appalled to see how similar the designs were. And yeah, uh, I was actually kind of flattered. Well, <laughs> I, I suppose imitation is the highest form of flattery, yeah. but I, I wondered if that was something that had crossed your path. Um, if you had thoughts yeah, on that, I, I I was shown that pretty quickly. In fact, I bought it, of course, because I mean I'm a Dick Tracy fan. Sure. So. So I mean, but I did notice that they changed that design after about three volumes. I think clearly it came home to the designer, whoever he was, that this was a little too close to home. But you know what the funny thing is, is I didn't mind because you know I am not among. There are many cartoonists out there who have you know like like somebody like Dan Klaus. There are so many people who start out imitating Dan, but nobody starts out imitating me. So I was kind of happy to see something, some like ping back from the world. <laughs> That's a, quite a gracious answer. <laughs> um, you know, you, you've talked about a lot of different areas that you work in. And uh, I was curious about process. Like if you have a standard day of, you know, X amount of hours in the studio working, like um, just curious how you juggle all of this stuff and how you approach working, because you do seem fairly prolific. Whenever I was looking at videos for this interview, uh, I found some uh, amazing things of you showing sketchbooks of handwritten, what looked like novels worth of text, um, working on a lot of different projects at once overlapping. You've mentioned this graphic novel in progress. So I wonder, do you have an approach to work to kind of balance all of these projects? It's a little ad hoc. I mean, I kind of work on what's most pressing and then I try to squeeze out time in between. So I have little projects that, you know, I try to work on all the time if I can, like, you know, certain diaries or things like that. But um, generally, it's like right now, today, I'll be working on a cover for this. Um, there's a series of magazines, a magazine that I've been doing the cover for, like, I don't know, 10 years or something. And I will. Uh, I, that's called Canadian Notes and Queries, which is probably one of the most, like, um, I don't know, precious old-fashioned, weird Canadian names you could make up, but that's what it's called, Canadian Notes and Queries. And um, I'll be doing that today, and I'll probably ink it tomorrow and send off the, the stuff to Tracy to turn it into a, a, you know, a file. And then the minute I'm done that, I'll work on something else. So like right now, I've got a, a little show coming up in uh, November of some paintings, so i got to get back to those. i got to churn out another 20 of those, I think, in the next month. But somewhere in there, if I get bored, if I can't, you know, just keep doing that day after day, 
I'll do something like I'll pull out like my Dominion notebook and I'll work on that for a couple of days. I find that I've tried to do the thing where you like you draw in your sketchbook in the morning and then in the afternoon you do what's, you know, some job you're working on and then at night you work on your comic. But I find that hard to switch gears. So I tend to like work in, in short bursts on things. As soon as I'm finished these paintings, it'll be back to the graphic novel and I'm hoping to spend like a good three months on that. Um, I don't do hardly any illustration work anymore for the simple reason that there just is no illustration work anymore. So, you know, if a job comes in the door, though, I'll change. You know, like if I get a call from like the New York Times that they want a portrait of somebody or something, I will take it. And then I will, you know, put aside whatever I'm doing at the moment and churn that out. But ultimately, it's all geared towards getting stuff done so I can get back to a couple of pet projects. And the pet projects I'm always trying to return to are whatever comic I'm working on and those Dominion notebooks. Because even though I've stopped making the city, the notebooks themselves have turned into a project of its own, a project with no specific goal, except to just keep delineating the history of the city, which I suspect might actually turn out to be my life's work. That all the other stuff might turn out to have been the stuff that I was doing while I was waiting to get back to the real stuff. I, I have a feeling when I'm dead, if anything survives me, it might be those notebooks. That's fascinating, man. Uh, one thing I'm curious about, uh, Chester Brown famously holds on to all of his uh, original artwork. Uh, what what happens with your pages? Do you hold on to them I don't all? hold on to things at all in the same way. But I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of certain... I use them to monetize my life, for sure. So it's like I actually produce art specifically to sell. Like this gallery show coming up is like not comic art. It's just paintings, uh, little paintings. And I, there's a gallery here in the town I live. And there's kind of a market for my work here. And I kind of gear it towards that. Every year or two, I'll do a show there. I'll produce, I don't know, 30 paintings or something. Uh, and then I'll put it there to sell that stuff. Now, if I were to put my comics in that gallery, they probably wouldn't sell. Or they wouldn't sell in the same way. This is like... People in this town know me as a local artist and they want something to hang on the wall. They don't want a, a comic page out of a 200 page story, but that stuff I would send to like a different kind of a dealer. Somebody like uh, Adam Gold, uh, um, Adam, what's his last name? Goldbaum. Yeah. Adam Goldbaum in, um, in New York. Um, but the, you know, there you kind of have to have a coherent show of some kind too. So right now I'm working on this big graphic novel and it's huge, but I hope to finish it up in three or four years. And when that's done, I'll probably start trying to have a big show or two, maybe a show in Paris too, and try and sell some of that artwork. I'm not going to sell any of it, obviously, before the, sh before the book. Um, Clyde fans, for some reason, I've hung on to it. I've got the whole book. Um, but I've slowly winnowed away the art on It's a Good Life If You Don't Weaken and... I've sold off bits and pieces of Wimbledon Green that's not in the sketchbooks. Um, you know, George Sprott, most of that art's out the door. Uh, I don't care about the art, not in the way that we used to care about it. Like, I know why Chester keeps all his artwork. And that was because back in the day, you couldn't trust the film at the pub, at the printing house. Like, what if the, you know, you heard too many stories of people who sold all the original art and the film got lost and blah, blah, blah. But now you can have all the copies in the world of your own work. I've got, I take a Xerox of everything and then I have full, you know, full high definition files and then there are fi files at the publisher and blah, 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 blah. So there's, there's very little chance that like, you know, the art will be lost. Um, but I think Chet's still hanging on to it in that sense. When he goes, he'll have everything he ever did. If you wanted to buy a cover off of Chet, you could, but he would redraw it and repaint it and sell you the remade one. And he'd keep the real one. I remember he used to have those ads in the back of Yummy Fur. You buy a panel, and I guess it was a recreation. But you know, I I, I regret totally. not buying every one of these kind of opportunities that have sprung up. Totally. When he was doing Louis Riel, man, uh, the beguiling was selling those uh, repros because I think he just would naturally draw two yeah, covers, I think he would do two. and then the one that didn't get published, he would he would sell. It's it's wild. Um, Seth, I, I'm curious what media you're painting in. And then also, I remember reading, I think it was in the back of Palookaville, that you would pencil and then you would ink on a separate piece of paper. I'm curious if you're still working that way. 
I do to some degree. Like this, this new graphic novel is definitely in that method. I've got, I'll do a pencil page. Uh, uh, although a pencil page now is is also fully drawn in marker because I'm working so much in marker. And then I'll scribble in tones with a pencil crayon. But I'll still throw that on the back of another piece of paper and um, ink on top with a light table. And in fact, the new method I'm using, which is to make things less precious, or let, let's say I can fiddle with it less, is that I'm using a colored paper. Uh, like a manila paper to, to do the final artwork on because you can't use whiteout. Um, it's like it prevents me from fixing up lines. And then I will put, co I'm painting color in, but it's all, it's create, come together into kind of a style I'm really, I love, but it's a style that I can do quite easily and still looks pretty finished. So I'm very happy with that. But a lot of the, the work I'm doing, like, you know, it's just purely sketchbook related, like, like you know, uh, nothing lasts is it's not in a sketchbook at the moment. It, I'm doing it on separate pages, but I just, I'll do a quick rough page, throw it on the back uh, with the light table. Then I will just go in with some gouache and put in all those blue tones. And then I will draw the, the lines in marker, like on top. It's I can ink a page there in like an hour. It's very quick. Um, it's uh, very perfunctory and I'm happy because um, I've made it a pleasure a joy to actually do it. I mean, that's why those pages are all like 20 panels or whatever, is I seriously did not want to waste a lot of time planning things. I'm like, just set up a grid, work within the grid, change it around a bit, but you know, let that determine what the pages look like. Don't recreate the world on every page. You can just, you know, just churn it out. Um, it's to be read. That's the important thing. Uh, the paintings I'm doing, they're gouache. I do a lot of stuff in gouache. I've gone back to many ways to the way I worked as a teenager. I just, I always worked in gouache and markers and um, in the in the paintings, I, I, I'm using ink. So there's brushes involved and stuff, but it's still very much like sketchbook quality stuff. It's a pleasure to do. Speaking of the sketchbook, uh, you know, there's a section in Palookaville 24 that is like, I think you call it sketchbook exercises, but it's five stories that are beautiful in the back of this. Are you working uh, without pencil? Like, are you going directly onto the page in, in paint with these? It's directly on the page, but there's some penciling. I'll throw in some light, you know, I'll, I'll shape out a composition. And then kind of, the, you know, the funny thing was a couple of years ago, I started to, I uh, got very interested in Hans Christian Andersen. And he did these amazing paper cutouts and he would tell a story. He would like say, he'd have a bunch of people around him and he would tell the story of the little mermaid. And while he was telling the story, he would have a big piece of paper and these giant scissors and he would just cut as he was telling the story. And when he finished at the end, he would open it up and it would be this big, amazing paper cutout. And I was like, it blew my mind. And I thought, wow, how tough is that, I wonder? So I pulled out a piece of paper and I just, without any planning, started to do some cutting out. And I found out it's not as tough as I thought. It's actually pretty easy to, with, you know, symmetry to create a pretty interesting complex design just um, with, you know, right off the top of your head, especially if you have a few mo motifs already in, in mind, like, you know, the stuff you're used to working with. Um, and I did that for about six months or whatever. And then I started to do more and more simpler and smaller paper cutouts. And it's led into a thing. I think I've done thousands of them by now. But the reason I bring this up is doing those paper cutouts where it's all positive and negative space. That's what led me into making those kind of strips in there, which are all non-linear. Like they don't have lines in them. They're all just shapes. I started to paint with color and ink in a different way than I was thinking before because I think all my cartooning before that had been very line based. Um, and that's changed a lot of my thinking and loosened me up. And that's why I could just put in a few shapes there. Here's a building and there'll be, you know, I'll have a dynamic here, it'll move towards this, there'll be a road down here or whatever. But it gave me a freedom to like, just start painting things in. And also in a sketchbook, you know, it doesn't work, doesn't work. And you can put some white out over that, you know, paint over that section. I've learned how to fix up things too, so. So it's, you know, and that's just pure fun. I've done more strips in that direction now. And I'm not working in my sketchbook as much as I used to, but I tend to be doing more strips, I think. Yeah, the shapes, uh, I think, is something that I've really gravitated towards in your work over the last, I don't know, as you've moved in that direction, it's something that's really stood out to me as, as 
being something I don't see a ton of, but I think of as foundational cartooning and, and maybe something that we all need to think more consciously about the yeah. shapes in our compositions. I really like hearing the, the way you sort of uh, hacked your mind into making comics of more pleasurable to, to draw, loosening up all of all of that part. And, you know, you spoke specifically about the drawing uh, part of the process. Uh, how, how has the writing uh, evolved? Yeah, the writing has actually evolved uh, equally, especially Wimbledon Green was super important for um, for teaching me lessons. It's funny, you know, in the introduction to Wimbledon Green, I mentioned three people. I mentioned Dan Klaus, I mentioned Chris Ware, and I mentioned David Heatley. And what I mentioned is they are all around that time were doing a certain kind of work where they were doing like short strips that were interconnected. And when you read them, it made a bigger whole. And I got very excited about that at that time. But I'd forgotten that years earlier, I'd been very, very interested in John Cage and his um, indeterminacy. This long 90 minute talk he gave where he would do a one minute, uh, 91 minute stories. This was super influential in my thinking when I was in my 20s. Uh, and I talked about it so much to Chester Brown that at some point it finally came out on DVD, on CD and he got me a set. Um, and I'd forgotten that, that that process of the 90 stories that are one minute long really got into my brain. And when I was doing Wimbledon Green, it was kind of the fulfillment of that idea to be able to do little things that you didn't sweat over that could somehow inter interconnect. And then later they would build their own world. I think this idea is essentially what I'm trying to do with everything I'm working on, which is don't overthink it. Let it build its own um, reality. Um, I, I'm doing this a lot with, you know, with the, the Dominion uh, project. It's like I made a few buildings. I, I came up with some businesses. I started to invent some people. And somewhere in my mind was this will come together into a history. These things will start to connect. It took years, but at some point it was true. They started to connect. And then I was like, oh, okay, this is the guy who runs the typewriter company, but he's also the guy who financed the television station, whatever. And then over time, there's more and more and more of this. And then at some point I was surprised, oh, wow, I actually think I have an idea of what this place is about. And that got tighter and then a map developed. And then I thought someday I'll get down to street level on this map. And that happened last year. So now it's like, you know, step by step by step, it becomes its own reality. And this is pretty true if you trust yourself to just tell the story. So like in Nothing Lasts, that was it's completely an exercise the same way as those um, sketchbook stories. I said to myself, I want to do some comics in my sketchbook, but I don't want to waste a lot of time planning. So what I'll do is I'll do the easiest thing. I'll tell my life story. But what I'll do to make it simple is to structure it so I don't have to think about it is just tell it chronologically and tell it based on the places that you lived in. So each section is like an address or a school or a whatever. And if I forget something, I'm allowed to say like, oh, wait a minute, I forgot to mention that blah, blah, blah. And actually that process of just letting it happen on the page saying, I don't remember what happened here or, oh, I forgot to mention that I told my dad this or whatever, that actually makes the writing better. It's better than planning it out. It's like it's got that organic quality of someone talking to you that um, I feel like has freed my voice up to some degree. I think when I was working on Clyde Fans, I was really trying in the beginning to like, you know, make a serious graphic novel. Um, by the end of Clyde Fans, I had a confidence to do things in it that I couldn't have done when I started just because there was a lot of water under the bridge. One of the uh, one of the other things I find interesting and in nothing last is that auto bio nature, because when I look at um, like it's a good life, if you don't weaken is probably the first book of yours that I read. And I feel like there's a lot of auto bio in that, even though maybe it's not strictly autobiography. Um, I wonder about that transition into doing full on autobiography. I don't know, from from a psychological point of view, is that something that because years have passed and your confidence is higher, you're more comfortable going that direction? Yeah, there's a big difference. I mean, when I was working in Palookaville, I was 29 years old in the first issue, I think. I'm 61 years old now. Um, I don't think of nothing less as autobio. I think of it as memoir. This is like, you know, I'm looking back. 
when I was doing those comics, like when I was writing those first couple of Palookavilles, I mean, the first issue of Palookaville is about something that happened to me like four years before that or something. Um, in many ways, it's like it was too soon for me to even understand that. I didn't know myself. Um, I was thinking a lot in those comics, probably those first few Palookavilles, about how I was portraying myself. Who did I want to be? Uh, I don't think about that anymore. It's like I know who I am now, and I'm trying to come to grips with what's happened in my life. Um, I'm very aware that I'm in the I'm on the, I'm on the in the golden years. This is like Joe Mad's death really brings up that like I could be dead next year. Um, it's it gives you a very different perspective. So I'm writing about, in a strange sense, I'm probably writing to understand myself in a different way. Back then, I was trying to figure out and project an idea of who I was. Now I'm going back and I'm trying to like look at what's happened in my life and figure out who I was. Um, it's the beginning and the end. Uh, and I feel like, I just feel, this feels natural to me. And I talk a lot. So it's not a surprise to me to like have a voice in the comics that just goes on. Um, that's what I do. I talk all the time. Seth, <clears throat> we'll be crucified if we don't ask about those beautiful leather bound books behind you <laughs> and uh what the contents of those books may be yeah well you're in my library right now this is the wimbledon green memorial library that's what it says on the door i'm not afraid of being too precious or coy or or pretentious um this is uh on the wall behind me is primarily bound volumes of two different things one uh on the far end that's mostly comics that's mostly stuff from my collection and on this side this is all stuff related to my own work so these are volumes of notes sketches um anything i'm working on i keep them and then when they're done i take them to the book binder and i bind them so there uh, many of these are just this section up here it's called groundwork and what that stuff is is anything that is preliminary so it's anything, if I make some notes or if I do a sketch or a fine, de finely detailed pencil, they just, uh, I, I keep them in a stack, put one on top of the other, and then that gets added to another pile. When it's fairly thick, I take it to the book binder and they bind it. Or some of them might be specific projects. I think the complete peanuts is somewhere, you know, right around there. So all the preliminary work for that. And, um, and, and, and that's primarily what that stuff is there. It's, it's all related to my work. That's amazing. Man. That's a good. I'm glad you asked that, Ed. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. Wow. I feel like archivists are watching this right now, drooling, you know, uh, <laughs> hearing what what is on those shelves. But I'm curious about collecting, Seth, because you you've kind of talked about, you know, your work really feels like this extension of you, um, and maybe probably every artist should kind of think about their work to some extent that way. But you talk about, you know, finding things, and and some of your work has dealt with this. Uh, collecting comics, collecting artists, collecting this ephemera from yesteryear. I wonder how collecting has changed in your lifetime. Yeah, collecting, I mean, it's the central thread of my life. I mean, we all understand this. We're cartoonists, so we started out as comic book fans and then comic book collectors. And from there, you know, it depends on the individual. But for me, collecting is a way of life, um, I think, as a collector. If I was going to write a character, one of the first things I would think about that character is what do they collect? Um, it really defines how, I mean, the interesting thing about being a cartoonist as opposed to a different kind of artist is that, and this was certainly true in my generation and probably still true for both of you guys, is that you had to collect up to figure out the history of your medium. It wasn't just presented to you as you went to the museum. And there it was hanging there. Or you took an art class and they told you the history of comics. You had to find it. And then in that process of collecting, you also found your um, ancestors. You said, like, who are the cartoonists that made me? Um, I think it was de Kooning who was asked once um, who had influenced him, what painters of the past had influenced him. And he said, um, I'm not influenced by painters of the past. I influence them, which I thought the first time I heard that, I thought, what an asshole. Uh, but later I thought, no, no, he's right. 
de Kooning was so popular and important that the artists who had he had made he had studied they were changed by the fact that they influenced him so it's like you know uh ditko is changed by the fact that dan klaus loves him so much this they become connected somehow this is an important thing and this is what you do as an artist you find these people in the past or these things these objects and you use them to define yourself i am entirely defined by the things i've collected and the identity i've created out of them i mean i'm really aware of it now i wasn't so aware of it when i started um, when I started, I was doing what a lot of young people do, which is I was trying to create somebody for myself to be. Um, it was important. I mean, I, I, I was like part of a kind of a new wave pug, punk subculture that was very much about image. And when I kind of segued out of that into Mr. Old Fashioned, um, that was a new identity I was taking on. Uh, over the years, that identity has just become like, sort of set in stone. I don't get up in the morning and think about, like, I'm trying to be Mr. Old Timey. Um, this is just who I am. My tastes are defined by the stuff I collected for 40 years. Um, this house is like a, a museum to my interests over time. Uh, I could walk you through and say, like, oh, here's a period I had where I was very interested in this particular artist or over here, I was collecting these um, appliances or whatever it is. And each of these is like kind of a, a phase of learning and interest because so much of it enters into the work. But a lot of it is just, I would call identity building. It's like, why do you get excited about something? It's because you kind of want to graft it onto your own uh, persona. You want to take that into the body. There's a genre of film you love. You don't want to just sit down and watch it. You want to somehow like... Um, own it. I think that's one of the reasons why fandom is so complicated because you want to say like, I own this, you don't own this. Um, because it's especially true if it's, you know, there's some stuff I'm perfectly fine to walk into a museum and share like um, Surratt with everyone, but I'm not so excited to share certain things if I have like a fairly obscure movie or something I love. And then I see some guys talking about it on the internet. I'm like, you, you idiots don't know anything about this because it's mine. It's personal. I might even steer away from knowing about stuff like that because I want to hang on to it. The interesting thing about human beings is we make a lot of things. Um, we're a strange species. Uh, why do we make so many things? Why don't we just make one umbrella, one design of umbrellas? Why are there a million designs of umbrellas? You could never collect all the umbrellas that were made. And you'd say, like, well, what was the point of that? Surely they all are essentially the same design, so why do we bother? But we like to make stuff, and we elaborate on things. And that elaborating process is so important to defining our identities. I have to have my own umbrella, a special umbrella that's for me. This process fascinates me because it's all about communication and that ability to like recreate yourself or maybe create yourself um, is at the very core of the communication of being an artist. What a capper, dude. Yes. Jimmy, you got some stuff uh, to, to sort of end on? I don't think we can top that. No, sir. <laughs> Wow, Seth, thank you, thank you so much for for coming through. Uh, Palookaville number twenty four has recently been released. Uh, we did a video earlier uh, this couple months ago, something like that. Uh, check out the comic, scoop it up. Uh, do you have anything forthcoming that you want to promote before we uh, get out of here? No, I don't think so. I got a bunch of projects going, but it's all just the usual stuff. Keep your eyes open for my graphic novel in the next few years. Uh, which hopefully won't be 20 years. But it was, it's a great pleasure being on with you guys. It's really nice. I hope we bump into each other at SBX or something. Totally. And when that graphic novel comes out, we hope to uh, speak to you again. I'd be happy to be here. Take care. Thanks, Seth.